For centuries, legends have told of an enormous ape-like creature who lurks in the world's most remote forests. Now it seems those fictional legends could be based on solid facts. If you have a more open mind and are willing to look for things, you might actually find them. Bigfoot, Sasquatch, the abominable snowman, are hairy beasts really roaming the swamps and forests of the globe? I'd always heard of Bigfoot, and so when I actually saw one, I knew that it was a Bigfoot. To see this thing that very calmly walking away and turning around just really shocked uh, the scientific community. Join the hunt for scientific evidence that could conclusively prove Bigfoot is more than age-old myth. My heart's just like coming out of my chest going, oh my God, oh my God, I can't believe this. Next on Weird Travels. In Asia, it's known as the Yeti, or abominable snowman. Some Native Americans call it Sasquatch, which means hairy giant. But for most people, this elusive beast is simply known as Bigfoot, for the giant footprints it leaves all around the globe. We'll travel the country and join the hunt. From the film that sparked the legend to the newest techniques developed to bait this elusive beast, Bigfoot enthusiasts claim the evidence is too compelling to ignore. Bigfoot-type creatures have been seen all around the world. There were reports from South America, you know, Amazon, the Himalayas, different parts of China, Russia, even in Europe. Tales of a towering hairy creature have been recorded for centuries. Medieval knights wrote of terrifying encounters with monstrous giants in Germany's Black Forest. And European folktales spoke of ape-like creatures attacking animals and even humans. In North America, Sasquatch sightings have been reported in every province in Canada and every state in the U.S. except Hawaii. Based on these eyewitness accounts, experts have tried to determine just how many of these creatures could be roaming our most inaccessible forests. It has been estimated by various people to be of the order of between six and 10,000 in North America. Yet in spite of thousands of documented sightings, Bigfoot still remains only a myth. But what will it take to make him a reality? Lauren Coleman is one of the world's leading cryptozoologists. He has spent 40 years investigating Bigfoot legends around the world and has written several books on the subject. Do people have a hard time believing in Bigfoot? Yes, some people do and some people don't. Bigfoot is a pretty unbelievable phenomenon. Here you have this large creature supposedly living right on the outskirts of where humans live without us having any scientific knowledge of them. But as more and more people join the search, conclusive proof that Bigfoot creatures exist could be discovered at any moment. If you have a more open mind and are willing to look for things, you might actually find them. In the United States, the best place to start looking is in the Pacific Northwest, where the largest number of Sasquatch have been sighted. Deep in Northern California's coastal foothills, the town of Willow Creek proudly boasts the name the Bigfoot capital of the world. Today, Willow Creek is home to a museum with the world's largest collection of Bigfoot paraphernalia. A life-size statue of Bigfoot in the town square and a Bigfoot ice cream parlor. Every year, thousands of people flock to this small town for a glimpse of the legendary creature. But Willow Creek wasn't always known for being a Sasquatch sighting spot. Once it was just a mining and logging town. And though rumors of Bigfoot have been floating around California since the early 1900s, it wasn't until 1958 that a construction crew here came across a startling discovery. It's off these trails that we seen many footprints. Ed Schillinger was a civil engineer who worked with three others during a road building stint near Willow Creek. At first, the crew members assumed the prints were a practical joke. Looking at each other and said, did you do this? Or I saw you sleep away from your tent one night. You must have done this. But the footprints kept appearing. It was almost on a daily basis. When we found these prints, we attributed them to this creature. After a newspaper published the crewmen's story, the nickname they had given the creature, Bigfoot, became ingrained in people's minds. 
the whole American phenomena of Bigfoot really starts in October of 1958, when the world really began to know this word through the media. Since 1958, people have used the word Bigfoot to describe any large, hairy, bipedal, human-like creature. A national obsession was born. It was easy to see why. The size of the footprints was staggering. Henner Fehrenbach is a retired zoologist who's worked extensively with Portland, Oregon's Primate Research Center. But outside his day job, he closely examines and extensively studies any scientific evidence related to Bigfoot-like footprints. At the top end, you have footprints that go well over two feet, and these are enormous. A large foot translates into an imposing and terrifying animal. A 16-inch footprint corresponds to 7 foot 9 inches. An 18-inch footprint would be probably 8.5 feet tall. Experts jumped at the chance to examine these large and mysterious footprints. Once you become accustomed to forests of the uh, United States, almost anywhere, it's really amazing that you ever find footprints because the ground isn't laid out for catching good footprints like the beach is. So when you do find them, they not only have an inhuman size, they are much wider. But footprints weren't enough to convince everyone that Bigfoot truly existed. Skeptics suggested the huge prints found in Willow Creek were the work of tricksters perpetrating a hoax. And some claimed bears were the culprits. I've been told by the California Department of Fish and Game that there's greater concentrations of bears in this part of northwestern California than probably anywhere else in the western United States, possibly even in the continental United States. A bear might step in its own track so that the forepaw combined with the hind paw may appear very much like a large human footprint. But others can't dismiss the prints so easily. I have found footprints in several locations on my own, so there was no question of somebody planting them for me. I mean, they were haphazard locations where I found it. And there's more. Henner even has hair samples of what he thinks is a Sasquatch. I have gotten two samples that I deemed legitimate. One sample consisted of two different hair batches from freshly twisted off trees. So I considered that sample quite almost like the gold standard. And some believe hair may be the way to prove Sasquatch exists. DNA analysis on supposed Sasquatch hair samples was once dismissed in the scientific community. But today, universities and labs around the world are testing hairs in hopes of validating the species or proving that it's a myth once and for all. Although Henner has submitted all of his samples for DNA testing, proving the hairs belong to Bigfoot may be close to impossible. All of these hair samples were submitted for DNA analysis by three different labs. All of them came up with the same problem that they could extract DNA, but it was too fragmented that they could not sequence a gene. And if you can't sequence a gene, you cannot tell what the hair came from. Hair samples and prints may not be reliable enough evidence, but the enormous strides of these hairy giants may reveal more about their true nature. This is one of the items that is least possible to be hoaxed. Their step length is enormous because they walk differently than we do. The average step length is five feet. You'd have to get a running start to go from footprint to footprint. And on some occasions, continuous tracks have been followed for miles with that foot step length. Do the footprints belong to Bigfoot? No one can tell for sure. But with sightings on the rise, more and more Bigfoot enthusiasts are intent on uncovering what's behind the Bigfoot legend once and for all. Coming next, new evidence reveals more about Bigfoot's identity. This thing that just really shocked uh, the scientific community. And later, bloody remains suggest Bigfoot may not be as harmless as many would like to think. Slammed it up against the tree and started pummeling it. In the Pacific Northwest and across North America, recorded Bigfoot sightings have been piling up for years, and experts are determined to find the one piece of evidence that will expose Bigfoot once and for all. Thousands of eyewitness accounts tell me there's something pretty credible going on with Bigfoot in North America. 
By now, I have probably read 12,000 eyewitness reports. If you throw out 90%, that's still 1,200 absolutely unimpeachable reports. But are these accounts simply the result of overactive imaginations? I'd always heard of Bigfoot, and so when I actually saw one, I knew that it was a Bigfoot. Ricky Masters Best is convinced a Bigfoot crossed her path in the Trinity Mountains near Redding, California, when she was 10 years old. Something caught the corner of my eye, and I looked up to the right, and I saw a Bigfoot up there running very fast. He was very large, I'd say seven, eight feet tall. That memory has always been burned into my brain. Plenty of doubters have refused to believe Ricky's story, but she's sure of what she saw. What always convinces them that I really did see Bigfoot is the only other thing it could have been is a bear running on its hind legs as fast as it can, and bears don't run on their hind legs, and bears aren't that big. But in 1967, Ricky's story would gain credibility when new evidence of Bigfoot's existence came to light. Two relentless Bigfoot hunters scoured the woods near Willow Creek until they made the discovery of a lifetime. Evidence of the creature's existence that to this day still has not been disproved. There was an expedition in search of Bigfoot that came into this area led by Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin and they shot 15 seconds of 8 millimeter film that's become quite famous of a supposed Bigfoot walking up the river bar where we're standing. Experts worldwide jumped at the chance to scrutinize the film. What they discovered brought Bigfoot into focus. But with the Patterson film, we know exactly how tall it was, about six and a half feet tall. We know what it looked like in terms of bulk. Close observation of the film shows muscle contraction, torn hair, wounds, and even female breasts. The creature's presence was shockingly human-like. To see this thing that appears to be a female, appears to be very calmly walking away and turning around, just really shocked uh, the scientific community. Footprints, eyewitness accounts, and now this film. Little by little, evidence seemed to be emerging that this creature was more than just the stuff of legend. But not everyone was jumping on the Bigfoot bandwagon. Rumors circulated that the so-called evidence was nothing more than a man wearing a costume. Somebody once said that it was by the same guy that did uh, the ape suits for Planet of the Apes, but those ape, su ape suits end up here. There were no ape suits like this in 1967. It just seems unusual that a costume would be designed that would be of a female rather than of a male. It just seems like that would take a tremendous amount of uh, creativity to, to design a costume like that. Hundreds of skeptics have tried to dispel the Patterson-Gimlin film as a hoax, but no one has been able to prove conclusively that the image is a fake. And for many people, film and footprints of the hairy creature still aren't enough to prove Bigfoot exists. It needs to be something not ephemeral like film or a plaster cast of a footprint, but something that you can hold in your hand that you can perhaps do genetic analysis on. Some think it may take even more than genetic tests to convince the skeptics that Bigfoot is real. The general scientific community is going to remain skeptical of the results until their nose gets rubbed in a corpse. Or a real live Sasquatch is captured. But since the creatures are thought to be nocturnal and extremely elusive, it's a huge challenge. People that have observed them with night vision equipment found that they hide behind bushes even in the dark. They do not like to expose themselves. And when they do get seen once in a long while where they're plainly exposed, that is simply pure chance as you sometimes win the lottery. The odds against winning that lottery seem high. But the Pacific Northwest is not the only place in America to look for the mysterious Sasquatch. In the 1960s, Bigfoot was sighted thousands of miles away in the small hamlet of Falk, Arkansas. And for some, it came a little too close for comfort. It was a tall, hairy, bipedal animal that was seen around people's houses in very rural Arkansas, very near the Texas border. Up there, they were reporting three-toed tracks um, that the Falk Monster supposedly left. The Falk Monster, as locals called their Bigfoot, was different from the others. It showed violent tendencies. It's like killing their dogs and their cows, and it picked uh, one like big pig up over a fence and just freaked everybody out. Everybody got scared. Things died down in the 70s, but people in Falk remained jittery. I just watch him and observe him and just leave him alone. There's no telling what he could do. 
But most Bigfoot are considered harmless to humans. I've never investigated a credible first-hand story of anybody being harmed, injured, killed, attacked by one of these things. So if thousands of eyewitnesses have seen Bigfoot, why has no one been able to track one down and capture it? Coming up, Skunk Ape emerges from the murky swamps of the Everglades. It's about 100 yards away, moving through the grass. And later, a team of Texas Bigfoot hunters finds that the closer they come to their prey, the hairier things get. We call it the Bigfoot curse. The steamy swamps of the Florida Everglades are home to loads of creepy creatures, like slithering reptiles and, of course, alligators. There's over one million wild alligators in the state of Florida, about three million in the U.S., incredibly strong animals. Many sightseers visit the swamps on airboats to catch a glimpse of the alligators. While gators may rule the Everglades, one Floridian in the small town of Achapi has spent the better part of his lifetime focused on another indigenous creature. A smellier version of Bigfoot called Skunk Ape. I heard about the Skunk Ape since as far back as I can remember, but when I was 10 years old, I was out here hunting with my brother, and we both saw something very unusual. It was about 100 yards away, moving through the grass seven, eight feet tall. And well, we knew what it was right away because we'd heard about the skunk ape. The reason they call it a skunk ape is because it smells somewhat like a skunk. The creature's pungent odor is a common element of many Bigfoot sightings. When people encounter Bigfoot and they say, it really smells like skunk or it smells like old garbage, they're just picking up on the fact that this creature is very much an animal of the woods. It's really taking on this natural protection. All Bigfoot smell because they live in the wild, but the damp, hot, and musty environment of the Everglades makes skunk ape especially stinky. The skunk ape seems to have frequent bouts with mange and other things that give us this incredibly deep, harsh, awful smell like a skunk. Legends of a long-haired, ape-like creature have been a part of local Native American lore for hundreds of years. And a choppy resident, David Sheely, is determined to turn these legendary tales into reality. David is a hardcore skunk ape enthusiast and expert, and claims to have had three close encounters with the skunk ape. His closest one came after tracking it every day for six months. It was getting dark one evening, and I heard something splashing in the water. And when I looked up about 100 yards in front of me, it's a skunk ape just coming right at me. I took photographs over approximately seven or eight minutes. What the photographs show is a skunk ape traversing a freshwater prairie and headed into a cypress swamp. So it was approximately six and a half feet tall, covered with reddish brown hair, moving just normal walking speed, walking on two legs. At one point it crouched down and then it stood back up again. I think maybe it's been feeding. Today he's wading through gator infested waters once again to see if he can catch another glimpse or a whiff of the stinky creature. All right, we're ready to go. So let's get going. Dave's not alone. His friends Rick and Jason are here to help. Yeah, we're going out basically in a direction towards the 10,000 islands. This area out here, we're going in. Skunk Ape's been sighted twice that I know of. It's a good area to uh, be hunting it. See everything, black bears, panthers, alligators. We got wild hog, white-tailed deer, bobcats, possums, coons, squirrels, snakes. Got it all. Hopefully, maybe a skunk ape. We're going to go to that little hammock right over there. And a hammock is a high piece of ground that forms here in the Everglades. I've seen skunk apes within a mile of here. It's a good place to set up a stand and take a look around. So I'm going to start with my binoculars working this area over and seeing what's out there. In the wide and open expanses of the Everglades, it would seem like an easy thing to spot a skunk ape. But in these parts, things are not always what they seem. The Everglades itself is elusive it's just it's a big area and it's just so easy to disappear into it talk about standing in a field blink my eyes and it's gone years of experience have taught david what and what not to look for 
Well, here in the Everglades, you're not going to find a whole lot of tracks, especially this time of year. So what I look for is where the grass has parted and something has moved through the grass. But as you can see, it's a, it's a large area, a lot of vegetation, just a great environment for a skunk ape out here. It's one of my favorite places. If you want to see a skunk ape, then right here, this is ground zero. This is where you're going to find them. This is a hot spot. Luckily for David, tracks aren't the only way to find the skunk ape. You know, I do smell something here. I smell a skunk. It does, don't it? That's the smell that you smell right there. We don't have skunks down here in the Everglades, in this part of the Everglades. Yeah, it smells like a skunk, which, as David mentioned, there's not skunks in this part of the Everglades. It's just too wet. So the smell can only mean one thing. Skunk ape is somewhere nearby. Can you smell it around there, Jason? Yeah. David and his team scour the area, but it's clear the only thing that's stuck around is the smell. It stinks in here. Probably got up earlier this morning, it's a little cooler, and moved out. As the creature's pungent stench lingers in the swampy air, David knows he's missed him again. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up here. We've, uh, we've looked the area over good. I'll be back out here again in, in a couple of days. After searching every inch of the Everglades for more than 30 years, David believes beyond the shadow of a doubt that Skunk Ape is real. And eyewitness accounts from others only further his cause. We came down to Ochapi to visit Dave in the Skunk Ape Research Headquarters office, and that's when we ended up seeing it on the way here. I saw the Skunk Ape about 50 yards off the road. I was pretty excited. I wasn't scared. When it happened, it was just like awesome. Can't believe it. I was coming from my home on my way to work in Everglades City and coming halfway down my road, Burns Road, something crossed in front of my car. I saw something that kind of looked like a bear. It looked like it was taller, like longer legs, and was kind of, can't explain, just like slinking or, you know, not like running fast, but it was standing in an upright position. And it took off. It was just a brief moment that I saw it and uh, went off into the woods. And then I was like, oh my God. I've got tracks and I've got photographs, hair samples, but the most credible evidence that I have that is undisputed and factual is the fact that hundreds of people are willing to swear that what they saw was real and that what they saw was a skunk ape. Whether he's wading in the swamps or collecting samples for his research, David says he is preserving the legend of Skunk Ape for generations to come. That's my goal, just make sure these things are protected the way they should be. I would like to be able to ensure the future of Skunk Apes here in the Everglades for many, many years to come. The Skunk Ape expert is hardly alone in his passion. In fact, outside of the Pacific Northwest in Florida, Texas boasts its own fanatics intent on proving that the Bigfoot legend is more than just a tall tale. Next up, a skeptical reporter comes face to face with Bigfoot. My heart's just like coming out of my chest going, oh my God, oh my God, I can't believe this. And later, startling signs of Bigfoot emerge from the dark woods of Texas. From the deep green forests of the Pacific Northwest to the mucky swamplands of the Everglades, rumors of Bigfoot-type creatures abound. But there's a region where sightings go back nearly 200 years. Despite its history, some are calling this unfamiliar land the New Frontier. Texas might bring to mind visions of cowboys and the Alamo, but few people outside of the Bigfoot community know that it's also a hotspot for Sasquatch activity and research. It is estimated that more than a thousand sightings have taken place throughout Texas in the last decade. And there's a new group of people who are putting everything they've got into proving the creatures as real as they come. Just 30 miles from the home of the Falk Monster in Arkansas, the small city of Jefferson in Northeast Texas has everything a typical town would have. An old time barber shop, a traditional general store, and an occasional freight train roaring through. But it's also a mecca for Bigfoot enthusiasts worldwide. 
Jefferson's not only the home to the annual Texas Bigfoot Conference, Mayor Ned Fratangelo has even designated an official Bigfoot Week in Jefferson. The proclamation actually designates September the 15th as the beginning of Bigfoot Week. All of this over a furry creature that might not even exist may seem a little much to the undiscerning visitor. But when night falls, it's obvious this area is cloaked in mystery. Locals say that night times when the Bigfoot roams the deep wetlands and bayou near Caddo Lake. The lake is extremely wild and really wilderness. A lot of the people there will tell tales of seeing the creature actually in the, the shallows of Caddo Lake, around the edges of the lake. In the 1990s, sightings in the area soared and terrified some of the townsfolk. In 1995, a group of people started the Texas Bigfoot Research Center. Today, President Craig Woolheater and his group are on a serious mission to validate the species. The Texas Bigfoot Research Center is a group of, of like-minded individuals with a common interest in the Bigfoot Sasquatch phenomenon. We all spend inordinate amounts of time and money away from family, home, our jobs, trying to get to the bottom of this mystery. You know, what are these animals? What do they do? What do they eat? How do they live? So far, there's a lot more questions than there are answers. Bigfoot's secret remains hidden in the Texas forests. And a state this big boasts more forests than most realize, which means even more spots for Bigfoot to hide. People don't think of Texas as, as heavily forested, but there's, um, in the state of Texas, I believe 22 million acres of forest land. That's more forest land than the state of Oregon. Is Bigfoot really lurking here? Plenty of folks think so. Reports of an ape-like man or wild man in the area date back to 1837. But the Texas Bigfoot craze started in 1965 when a newspaper story broke about a boy who said he'd come face to face with a frightening creature on a country road. He heard a noise. He turned around and looked and he said there was a huge man. He had hair all over him and he was very tall and big, and he started running. And he said he tore the soles off of his shoes before he got to his home. While doing his journalistic legwork, Dwayne Dennis happened upon a rather surprising footprint. It would have taken an artist to make that footprint. It was yay long, five, Toes, and I just don't think that uh, a person could make something that quick and be that realistic. Well, that puts me in the thing that I think is true. It didn't take long for Bigfoot mania to catch on around Jefferson. Since the report in 1965, thousands of sightings of a hairy bipedal monster have been reported, and the momentum is growing. According to the Texas Bigfoot Research Center, or TBRC, in the last decade, an average of 150 sightings are reported each year in the sleepy northeastern part of the Lone Star State. But why here? In Texas, I would say 80% of the sightings are predominantly in the eastern third of the state, where the rainfall totals are more than 35 inches of rain a year. It leads us to believe that these animals want to be in areas where there's abundant rainfall. And that also means there's more wildlife for Bigfoot to feed on. Unsuspecting hunters are usually the first ones to encounter this frightening creature. Of the hundreds of sighting reports, one of the most compelling was a, a guy that was out hog hunting, and he caught movement, something coming up. There was one of these creatures, and this creature crouched down behind a tree checking things out and actually pounced out and grabbed one of these hogs. It pretty much took the hog, slammed it up against the tree, and started pummeling it. Killed the hog, picked up the hog, threw the hog over its shoulder as it's taking off. It turns around, looks back at him, looks directly at him, and you know throws its head back and just makes this god-awful vocalization. Scared the hell out of him. Investigating sightings like these, along with finding any traces of the creature, are what the Texas Bigfoot Research Center is all about. Every month, the members of the TBRC hold weekend expeditions to search for the elusive man-ape. You know, when we're out here doing a research operation, combing the area for evidence, almost like CSI, you know, we're treating the area as a crime scene, forensics, looking for tracks, uh, trying to preserve the area. It takes all sorts of equipment and gear, from sound and video recorders to pheromone chips with gorilla scent for attracting Bigfoot to their location. The big thing is collecting evidence 
to prove their existence because we're not wanting to harm them. We're just wanting to prove that, yes, they're here, they need to be protected, and we want you to know that they are here, but they're harmless. They're not going to hurt you. Their mission recently gained momentum after one member said he saw Bigfoot. Mike Hall was accompanied by a newspaper reporter who had been covering a story about their expedition. We topped a hill about uh, three quarters of a mile from where we had left the other guys, and uh, I heard her say, what's that? My heart's just like coming out of my chest, going, oh my god, oh my god, I can't believe this. Of course, the reporter, who's been a skeptic uh, this entire weekend, is her eyes are just the size of saucers. The incident convinced Mike more than ever that something had to be hiding in the Texas woods. To the skeptics and to the people that, in the academic community that, that want to, you know, be naysayers and say, well, there's no possible way that these creatures exist. I, I would issue the challenge to them to, to actually step out of their comfort zone, get out from behind the desk, get out of your classroom, get your head out of a book, step into a forest, and actually do some of the research that we're doing. Bucket, this is Red River. Radio check, over. The group is on the lookout for any evidence they can find. They stake out an area where several alleged sightings have occurred. There's no telling if this will be a lucky night or if they'll come up empty-handed. The woods here have been referred to as Texas jungle. It will be so dark that you literally will not be able to see your hand in front of your face. All I can say is, um, you know, we're working hard to validate these animals and we feel that we can do it. Up next, will the legendary guest of honor make it? Or will he be a no-show? Look, look, here's fingertips. Yeah, that's look, what I said. Fingertips, right there. Today, the Texas Bigfoot Research Center volunteers are on the prowl. They are determined to track down Bigfoot across the murky woods of East Texas and put the myth of the Sasquatch to rest once and for all. We're in southeast Texas. This area is known as the Big Thicket, and it has a long history of sightings. The majority of Sasquatch sightings occur at night, so the crew spends all day preparing for their expedition. Armed with maps and audio and video equipment, the team begins the two-mile hike deep into Big Thicket National Preserve. Tonight, it will be so dark that you literally will not be able to see without some sort of visual aid, like night vision. But even using those inside the woods, they can be really useless. In addition to night vision, the team sets up speakers high in the trees. It's a tracking technique called call blasting, a loud broadcast through the woods to attract Bigfoot. That technique is to use recorded vocalizations of known primates, like gibbons or chimpanzees, and also use recorded vocalizations of what we believe to be Sasquatches. And we broadcast them into the area at high volume. The objective with that is to get a vocal response from any Sasquatches that may be in the area. We've had responses. As the team advances into the forest, they decide to split into groups. They'll disperse to various Bigfoot sighting locations and communicate by walkie-talkie. And voices are always kept at a whisper, careful not to scare the big beast away. Volunteers are finally set up to listen for sounds of Bigfoot. We've heard coyotes, we've heard barn owls. There's some animal activity, that's good. Some hunters think animal activity is the litmus test when listening for Bigfoot. They believe that if Bigfoot shows up, the other animal's activity will cease, a good indication that there's a new presence in the woods. At the stroke of midnight, they blare a vocalization recording of a gorilla and then listen for a response. But suddenly, a group on ATVs roars through the woods. It seems all this ruckus would scare any Bigfoot away. But minutes later, things get back to normal. Oh, we've been hearing barred owls again. Uh, uh, just a 
if nothing ever happened, so we're glad to know that. So anyway, we're still holding hope out that perhaps we'll have some activity tonight. As the team continues to blast their gorilla vocalizations into the night, their patience finally pays off. A similar sound emerges from the woods. It sounded like it was a lot closer. It seems like he's heading this way, over. Roger that, Red River. Was it loud enough for your team to record? It's a sound unlike any they've heard before. Could it be the sound of Sasquatch? The only way that I can explain it uh, in terms of how it feels or, or the response it gets from us is that it's just an unbelievable uh, feeling. Uh, and, and the sound is incredible because it's so loud. You're just in awe. You can't help but be in awe when you hear these things. After an all-night hunt for the elusive beast and with their recordings in hand, the team makes the two-mile trek back to base camp. But once at the campsite, they discover something strange on one of the SUVs. Look, look here's fingertips. Yes, right there. Did Bigfoot sneak up on the vehicles while the team was out tracking him down? He was standing here, and he leans down and looks in the, the car. When these stickers are eight feet tall, you got to think of something eight feet tall looking in. There are fingertips, and it's humongous. The size is just huge. And you can actually see where the hair goes through the print. We think it's a very significant find. A genuine Sasquatch fingerprint could be just what the TBRC needs to validate the species. But they'll have to wait for the sun to come up to call on the local forensic expert and get the answers they need. It's 0536 right now. We're trying to wind down. Uh, got a little excitement, a little adrenaline going. Plus, we're tired. Our feet are hurting. Right and early the next morning, the team calls Jimmy Chilcutt, a retired fingerprint technician at the Conroe Police Department, to come and examine the massive print. Hey, Daryl. How's it going? Jimmy, good. Well, what you got for me today? It looks pretty interesting. It's awful wide. It's definitely wider than the regular hand. Now I'm going to take a fiberglass brush and a little bit of black powder. Jimmy Chilcutt is highly regarded by the FBI and the DEA for his innovative methods of analyzing fingerprints. He's also an expert on non-human primate prints. He was once a skeptic, intent on debunking the legend of Bigfoot. But after examining many Bigfoot castings, he changed his mind. When I did see the, the ridges on those castings, it did indicate that, hey, maybe there is a, an animal out there. By using the techniques he once used to catch criminals, Jimmy Chilcutt carefully examines the group's discovery. After some meticulous work, more evidence comes to light. On closer examination and under the side lighting, you could clearly see there was not one print. It was actually four different occurrences. Could Bigfoot have lingered at base camp while the team was in the woods? Maybe it was a family of Sasquatch. Or are these prints the marks of a less mysterious forest animal? Coming up, what will the final evidence reveal? Find out next. Daryl Collier and his team of Texas Bigfoot researchers have been out all night scouring Big Thicket National Forest in East Texas for signs and sounds of Bigfoot. Back at base camp, they discover a strange print on one of their vehicles. The next morning, local forensic and primate expert Jimmy Chilcutt is called in to examine the mysterious print. The team stands by in nervous excitement. Now this palm print looks like it's kind of going to kind of be weird because it looks like it was placed on this type of manner. I can see it's two people, two different people have touched okay. it. People or unidentified creatures? The team hopes it's the latter, but Jimmy's results aren't what they hoped for. What happened here, I believe, is that this print was, was put on there inadvertently by a, a crew or a, a passenger. Turns out the print isn't Bigfoot's after all. We thought we had something, but it turns out we didn't, but that's okay because what we're after is the truth. And even Jimmy agrees the only way to get to the truth is to examine all the evidence. These people that come out here and do the research, 
they're to be admired because they spend the mosquito-ridden, chigger-infested time out in the woods searching for evidence of this animal, for photographs, for any type of physical evidence they can gather. And believe me, they spend long hours, hot nights, with little sleep. So any evidence that they come up with needs to be examined by an expert. And the Texas Bigfoot research crew isn't going home empty-handed. They've got a recording of an unidentified creature that could be the Bigfoot they're looking for. I have to say that in all the time I've spent in the woods, I have never personally heard anything like that. That was a real treat for me. It kind of validates my coming out here. But until they uncover it, their hunt for Bigfoot will continue. The future of the Texas Bigfoot Research Center is to continue to go out into the field and to try to gather more evidence, to try to gather conclusive evidence so that we can achieve our goal of validating this animal as a legitimate documented species. Whether it's in the woods of Texas, the coastal foothills of Northern California, or the murky swamps of Southern Florida, the search for Sasquatch continues. We as a culture have always had a fascination with these things, and it plays upon our social consciousness that these things might exist. And I think people like an idea of something that is yet to be discovered and is, is unknown. But Bigfoot experts say they already know plenty about the creature, even if they've never actually set eyes on it. I'm not really frustrated by the fact that I've not seen Bigfoot. I've found footprints. I've heard sounds in the woods. I've interviewed literally hundreds of people. I've seen the evidence in many other forms without actually seeing the creature, and that's fine. Even the most avid enthusiasts know their chances of spotting the hairy beast are extremely slim. We're not looking for a needle in a haystack. Uh, with these things, we're looking for a moving needle in a whole field of hay. You know, these things are very mobile. They make their way across a pretty good amount of territory on a daily basis, gathering food just in their daily travels. According to David Sheely, people who don't believe Bigfoot is real simply haven't done their homework. Before they pass judgment on me or anything else and possibly do grave harm to what could be an endangered species, they need to come down here to the Everglades themselves and get their feet wet and take a look at what I got to show them and not just sit back in a chair and say, oh, this could never happen. So what would it take to convince armchair skeptics that these creatures really do walk the earth? The only way that the world is going to be shocked into the recognition of Bigfoot is with a Bigfoot body of an animal that's been captured alive, hopefully, in which DNA sampling can occur. Hopefully then they can let it go. Until that happens, Sasquatch seekers will keep venturing into gloomy forests and dangerous swamps, driven by their need to find the truth. It's a burning desire for me to try and get to the bottom of this mystery. So many questions and, and so far not very many answers. 